Good afternoon. Today we have World Sepsis Day live webinar by Indian Association of Medical Microbiologists. The World Sepsis Day initiative of the Global Sepsis Alliance and has been established in 2012 with the mission to provide the global leadership to reduce the worldwide burden of sepsis. Every year on September 13, countless events raising awareness of sepsis are organized all over the world. Indian Association of Medical Microbiologists has always been at forefront disseminating awareness and education around the issues of pertinence among the healthcare fraternity. We at IAMM National Body, with the efforts of Dr. Vattal, celebrating World Sepsis Day every year, having a national webinar. This year's theme is the enigma of sepsis, how much of it has been resolved, is the theme, and my due thanks to the Bionario for their support. On behalf of IAMM, I welcome all participants of this webinar. At the outset, I am privileged to introduce Dr. Vattal, who is moderator of today's webinar, but shoulders many responsibilities of IAMM. The eminent faculty team of today's webinar, Dr. B.K. Rao, Dr. V. Balaji, Dr. Sentu Numbi, I welcome them and thank them also. Now, uh, Dr. Professor Dr. Chand Vattal, who is uh, working as a chairman Institute of Clinical Microbiology and Immunology, Sir Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi. He has been a recipient of a several awards to name a few Hospital Management Asia Award 2002 for the best hospital infection control program, Dharma Vira Award for Excellence, Yes Nandi Award as the best publication of the year, Long, Dis Long Distinguished Service Award by Sri JP Nadaji. Union Health Minister, Best Publication of the Year in Virology, published in IJMM. He has in, been a recipient of IMM Endowment Award 2016. He is an immediate past president of IMM Delhi, and he is shouldering a very uh, responsible person as an editor-in-chief uh, in the last three years and uh, doing an excellent job for uh, IMM. He has been a valued office bearer Treasurer, Coice and Secretary of IMM Daily Chapter since 2006 to 2016. But I will say that he is a very valued office bearer of National Body also. He is working as a chairman of an ECWAS program for North India uh, for the clinical microbiology under the ages of National Body of IMM for the country. He has more than 35 years of experience in a specialty 120 publications in index, national, and international journals. He has delivered or chaired more than 268 sessions or lectures. With this short introduction, I hand over the proceedings to the dependable, reliable, and responsible person of IMM, Dr. Vattal. Vattal, sir, please. Thank you, Dr. Patel, uh, for your kind words. And uh, just give me a few minutes. I uh, share my slides. And uh, probably it, I feel a little embarrassed when uh, Dr. Patel was repeatedly trying to share his sentiments. I wish to thank him for that. But I try and do my best, whatever possible in whatever conditions. So we are back again this year, trying to think of sepsis again. And this is how the we have been doing it every year on uh, even including uh, Corona time. We did not actually stop. Uh, 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 I don't know why this is not moving. So we have continued even during the corona time to look into uh, the sepsis issue as to where we are. And when we are talking of uh, the enigma as to what this enigma is, I remember when I joined the medical school and in somewhere around uh, maybe 
30, 30, 35 years or maybe 40 years back. And my first seminar as a uh, third year student was, I was given the seminar topic as sepsis. And I thought I knew everything on that day and there is no enigma. And as the things progress, you can see this uh, and this, uh, we're trying to get out of this, which is not re really very easy. Sorry, sir. Your slides are not being shared. Uh, slideshow is not there, sir. Slide, but here it is. I will have to stop the share and share it again. So yes, sir. kindly bear with me. Is it visible now? Is it visible now? No, sir. Uh, it is in the on the slideshow here. Yes, we got it, sir. Is it in the slideshow? Yes. We we can see, sir. No, but is it in it the slideshow? It is not in the slideshow. We need to go into the slideshow more. Then we'll have to again or uh, start from here. Is it visible now in the slideshow? No, sir. We have to stop share and share again. This is what happened when we were just trying to check as to what has happened. Push, push. All participants then. Now it is visible, sir. Is it in the slideshow? Yes, sir. Okay. Now uh, let me see if I can I can roll it. So that's another issue. Yes. So I was here and I was trying to come out of uh, this enigma now and this is year 2022. So as we will understand, try and see as to where we are going and I expect my uh, fellow colleagues uh, to give us this kind of a situation as to what has happened now where we are at the moment. So we know that the global burden of sepsis and related syndromes are most common causes of admission to intensive care units across the world. In the USA, deaths due to sepsis exceeds due to the breast carcinoma, prostate cancer or, or AIDS combined because of sepsis. And if you look at the hospital mortality due to sepsis, though it's a slightly older data, 2005 and 2015, not much has changed. Data from 27 high-income countries shows that hospital mortality due to sepsis is 17% and hospital mortality due to severe sepsis is 26%. And global estimate of incidence and mortality due to sepsis, and particularly in low-middle-income uh, countries, is 31.5 million cases globally due to sepsis, 19.4 million cases globally due to severe sepsis, and deaths due to sepsis estimated at 5.3 million deaths. So if we look at uh, this cartoon over here, every second counts. Then we also understand from other authors here, you will see that every second counts. One out of every 23 patients in the hospital has sepsis, and 40% of ICU spending is on sepsis. If you look at this uh, very commonly presented slide where we are talking of the patient's survival rate, it keeps on decreasing if the, num the right kind of antibiotic is delayed. Similarly, if you look at the annual death, severe sepsis just follows acute my myocardial infarction. When you talk of the length of stay, you can see the severe sepsis increases the length of stay and the mortality, 10th leading cause of death in uh, US. This is our own data from Dr. Cody, who is uh, uh, published this in uh, Journal of Critical Care Medicine in 2017, where you can see the attributable mortality is around 85%. And you can see mortality due to severe sepsis is 56%. It is a very high burden that we are carrying in our country as well when we are talking of sepsis. So what are we facing? So ladies and gentlemen, increasing resistance in gram-negative bacteria in Indian hospitals. And the last resort drugs we are failing us. Non-susceptibility to third generation cephalosporins and chloroquinolones has increased considerably, particularly in Klebsiella pneumoniae, Esterobacter, and 
pseudo monasgo which has started uh, mellow mellowing down uh, lately non susceptibility to meropenamine staphylococcus aureus klebsiella pneumoniae pseudo monasgo aeruginosa and e coli the teen person klebsiella pneumoniae are non susceptible to carbapenems and uh, colistin cons are far more resistant than staph aureus and causing more clinical infections in central line associated blood stream infections and catheter related blood stream infections is all susceptibility when we are talking of candida septicemia has also come down considerably and multi drug resistant candida aureus has been reported from every corner of the country and abroad so these are some of the things that are actually ailing our icus as well so indian icu scenario for drug resistant infections what you see the prevalence by dhruv choudhury from rotak who has published this in association journal of association of chest physicians gram positive are hardly 16 and you can see gram negatives are predominantly over there and fungi also are trying to catch up with the gram positives so major icu infections are caused by gram negative organisms again in the indian icu scenario for drug resistant indicap study that again dr dhruv choudhury has uh, uh, published from 124 icus and more than 4000 part patients you can see gram negative organisms are around 70% gram positives uh, uh, a little behind and fungi are actually uh, catching up the so icu indian icus are plagued with gram negative bugs we will hear more from dr rao and dr sendhu and to the cardiologist time is muscle to the neurologist time is brain to the physician caring for septic patients time is survival and has the time come for optimum synergy between various specialties we had a round table discussion within a uh, critical care uh, spe- uh, a group of uh, physicians where it was uh, uh, agreed upon that convergence of minds is a requirement of the day for better patient outcomes in intensive care care units and this uh, round table discussion was published in journal of uh, critical care medicine in 2000 uh 17 many more people on that conference agreed for a convergence for convergence of minds so ladies and gentlemen i welcome you all on this uh, webinar like that of every year across the country and maybe some of the sar countries who might have joined by now the scheme of the things is here that we will be having the discussion uh part for the first one one hour and another one hour will be dedicated to a panel discussion and uh every uh, uh faculty has been allotted around 20 minutes each i would request all of them to stick to the time so that we have meaningful discussion and have time for uh, the questions that the uh, listeners are going to uh, ask us and uh, 20 minutes as i said has been given by the organizers to all the speakers and we have very distinguished faculty amongst us and it's a pleasure to listen to all of them who have a huge experience uh yes. with them we have dr b k rao he is from my institution i take uh, pride in introducing him who is the chairman of his department of institute of critical care he is actually who started this specialty in india as a uh, with the board uh, national board he is trained as an anesthesiologist but is a critical care specialist by now he is a medical administrator of our excellence and was formerly also the chairman of the board of management of our hospital sar gangaram hospital he is a recipient of padma bhushan in recognition of his exceptional contributions to medical science he is also currently the chairman of nabh and has been an ex member of the board of governors MC, uh, of mci we have dr sentur namdi with us who is a consultant uh, infectious diseases uh, physician at apollo hospital chennai a leading infectious disease specialist with 20 years of experience he has various publications and articles in many reputed national and international journals to his credit he is former secretary of the clinical infectious diseases society of india i hope he has joined by now he wanted to join by 4:15 is dr namdi here as it, as he uh logged in maybe he's logged logged in as we progress in our presentations and uh, a very distinguished uh, clinical microbiologist of the country dr balaji v raghavan who is at cmc velour 
and it's a privilege to have him on our program and uh, discuss some very wild, uh, vital issues as far as sepsis and the organism having the resistance is uh, considered. You can see in his applications that he is the professor of clinical microbiology at the Distinguished Institute of CMC Valor, the Hilda Lazarus Core Research Chair. He holds that and is principal investigator on AMRSC and SN at ICMR. His research interests are diagnosis of sepsis, detection of antimicrobial resistance and surveillance research, antimicrobial stewardship, and hospital infection control. Other highlights are that his publications are more than 70 articles in Next Journal. He has been the past editor in chief of Indian Journal of Medical Microbiology, from whom I took the mantle uh, forward. And it was an easy thing for me since it was held by him. Uh, previously. So, thank you ladies and gentlemen. This is what I told you. This is the agenda for today. Dr. Rao will be talking on uh, surviving sepsis guidelines. Dr. Balaji will talk on diagnostic stewardship, balancing the pearls of sepsis and advances in sepsis care will be by Dr. Senpur uh, Nambi and then we will have a panel discussion as I said. I would request Dr. Rao to kindly uh, start sharing his slides and go ahead with his presentations. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I will stop sharing. Give me a second. Thank you very much. Dr. Rao, please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Vatal, for the kind introduction. And I thank the organizers of the Indian Medical, uh, Indian Association of Medical Microbiology for inviting me to deliver my talk on a very important topic. We've heard the background, we have heard the disease burden, we have heard how serious things are at present as far as sepsis is concerned. And I'm going to be talking about the guidelines which were released in 2021. Uh, the Global Sepsis Alliance has been uh, alluded to earlier by uh, Professor Spartan. What the definition remains unchanged, so it is an organ dysfunction caused by the dysregulated host responsive infection. They were released about a year back, so it's time to again celebrate because it's going to be the first anniversary of this. It is for the adult patients and it is for the sepsis and septic shock. These are to be kept in mind. They are not for children. They only reflect the best practices and the clinical judgment will always prevail because it is very difficult to generalize things and come to a very narrow kind of guideline. So these are broad guidelines which we have to understand. What they did was they made 93 statements and this is the breakup of those statements. And if since it is a microbiology con, um, uh, webinar, I'm going to be limiting myself to the infection part because this is a huge guideline and 20 minutes is just not good enough. But Dr. Vatal did allude to the, um, you know, the uh, sharing, of, sharing of responsibility while managing these patients, while caring for these patients. And that is what was brought in in 2016 guideline and they have been expanded in the 2021 guidelines. They came out, this is the this is the comparison between the 16 and 21 guidelines. And if you see here, the strong recommendations have gone down. The number of no recommendations have gone up in 2021. The rec strong recommendations are down and more of them are weak recommendations. So that is, that is what is important for us to understand that because of the diversity in terms of the reported literature, in terms of clarity in the outcomes, in terms of the ambiguity or uh, what we, we can say that, you know, the, um, the difference between the benefit and the harm may be very narrow. So they have put them in the week, which are they say as suggestion and they are not making that as a recommendation. If we look at the whole guidelines out of the 93 statements, the only one that pertains, which is a strong recommendation, is time to antimicrobials. 
there is nothing else in infection which comes up as a strong recommendation everything else is a weak recommendation with weak or with a low or a very low kind of quality this is what i was talking the time to antibiotics the infection is dealt over 12 so they start from the diagnosis of the infection then when to start how long to start when to escalate when to de escalate how do you deliver and then going on ultimately to how do you discontinue the antibiotic and out of that the only thing which has a strong recommendation is time antibiotics because that is what has been shown to effect the outcome of the patients hemodynamic i am not touching in detail they they talk of what to give when to give what ways of process to give how much to give and all those things ventilation starting from the oxygen going on to the ecmo they deal with all modalities of ventilation including the prone ventilation and the recruitment this also i am not going to be touching upon because this is not related directly to the infection these are part of the general ic care so it is not specific about sepsis some of the additional therapies which have come up like blood purification immunoglobulins and vitamin c again not directly related to the infection but to the sepsis but some of them have been new additions so maybe i'll refer to them while uh, my talk is on this is what dr bathur was talking about the shared decision making and for the first time they have talked about these patients care doesn't end in the icu a lot of it goes on after post discharge And and the economic and social support, and this is very important for a country like us, where we know that you know these these patients do have financial uh, difficulties because of their treatment in the ICU. So let's start with the first one: that how do you screen patients for sepsis and septic shock? Again, sepsis screening. We all know that whether that is done by Kisofa or by the news that we have, uh, that was there in the 2016. Also, they have not changed it. what they have added is the soaps that is the standard practice um that is what has been added it was not there in the 2016 and they are both strong recommendations standard operating procedures was not there earlier it has come up in this one where did i go where did i <clears throat> the second one was again a strong recommendation do not use qsofa for the screening of these patients because qsofa has got high specificity but very low sensitivity and they have seen that a lot of patients who actually had severe infection did not have a significant or, or a qsofa of more than 2 so they say that if you are using a single screening tool that do not use qsofa use the muse and the news that is the national early warning or the modified early warning signs again they say use lactate over not using lactate because lactate may not be very diagnostic or prognosticated or whatever but if you have a high suspicion and you have a lactate which is high then probably somewhere it correlates and corroborates that your diagnosis of sepsis may be right these are the um, numbers so their statement number 4 to 8 are mentioned here and this one says about the septic shock and the hypoperfusion they if the patient requires fluid they say give 20 liters 20 milliliters per kg in the first 3 hours and give it crystalloids and not colloids do use the dynamic measures say for example you are using the leg raising you are using the pulse pressure variation the stroke variation the echocardiography whatever you are you have facility for rather than examining the static parameters like for example cvp or examining the patient and then coming to the conclusion that patient is adequately resuscitated again they talk of serum lactate and they are saying that do not use a regime in which to you do not use serum lactate and target resuscitation so that the lactic levels start going down 2 hours 20% and those kind of you know targets can be there but it is not absolute must but yes that is something which guides your resuscitation for the first time they have brought in a capillary refill time so this could be a clinical parameter because lactate may not be easily available not everywhere because you really need a iron specific electrode for the lactate and the cost of running that is pretty high so clear capillary refill maybe a good thing that if it is less than 2 seconds then you know that your patient has good peripheral perfusion 
in the in the hypo in the uh, shock they are talking of maintaining a uh, map minimum uh, the mean arterial pressure of 65 they say anything higher than that does not help in the outcomes anything lower than 60 is going to be bad for it so it's a wrong strong recommendation that you maintain it around 65 If you have to get a patient into the ICU, get it in within six hours. Again, it's a weak recommendation. But one thing is for sure that more you delay, the more the the patients a bad outcome will be there. So probably the cutoff time could be around two two and a half hours. If you have to have a patient within the ICU, then that is the time while you are looking at. This is from where the this is statement number eleven. That is from where they start the diagnose the infection part. so the first thing that comes and that is where the, we were talking about the enigma that how do you know that the patient has got sepsis septic shock may be yes but how do you know patient has got sepsis the infection may not be confirmed and we know that 30% of the patients where we think the patients were infected do not turn out to be infected they have a non infectious condition so this is the enigma for which what we do clinically is we continuously reevaluate we always look for an alternative diagnosis you know we have a high suspicion okay it could be infection but look for other causes as well and that is where probably you know the the uh, faster turnaround time of the current investigations from the microbiology lab helps us and if you find that there is an alternative cause then the antibiotics have to be stopped and that is a recommendation coming up and that is a best practice as we know it so antibiotic timing how do you how do you uh, time the antibiotic we all know that in the previous one also we had that try and give it in the one hour so what we do is this if you have a sepsis which is probable or definitive irrespective of whether shock is present or shock is not present you have to give the antibiotic or start the antibiotic within one hour but this strong recommendation is not so strong when it comes to patients who are not in shock especially when it is a possible condition and not a definitive condition so in patients when you think a sepsis is possible but your patient is not in shock then the best recourse will be that you examine the patient clinically and do the run the test and try and do that within 3 hours and if you find that you still have a suspicion or if the patient uh, is not stabilizing then probably is the time to give antimicrobials and that is where the 3 hour bundle comes in but if your patient is in shock and you think sepsis is probable then you have to stick to the 1 hour regime but the point is that if you think that the likelihood of infection is low and the patient does not have shock and and you think that you know you you are quite sure of what you are talking about then it is best to defer antimicrobials monitor the patient reevaluate the patient exam the put lab tests in place and then decide whether you want to go ahead and give antibiotics or you don't want to give antibiotics what what about uh, biomarkers to start the antibiotics the uh, you know pct is one thing that has been talked about but the guidelines say that pct is not a, you know a thing which will rise in the first hour and it will take time it costs a lot doesn't add much to the information which you can have from the clinical evaluation so the guidelines recommend against using a combination of clinical and the pct they say clinical is good enough when it comes to the empiric then you have to talk about the mrsa and the non mrsa if you have a high risk of mrsa they say you should give the mrsa coverage and if you have a low risk then do not use antibiotics which cover the mrsa now this is one thing which uh, you know again you have to go by the uh, risk factors by the colonization by the previous history a lot of things have to go into that so the answer to this is not very easy but it whole lot depends on the prevalence of mrsa in your own organization then comes the question of double antibiotics in gram negative patients obviously you will go by these risk factors you know you the mdrs the local prevalence the risk factors the severity of illness shock is one of them and if you think that your patient has a high risk then you have to use two antimicrobials one of them will cover at least one of them will cover the gram negative so this is a combination which is recommended 
If you don't have a um, high risk, that means you have a low risk of anti uh, antimicrobial, then they say that you do not use two antimicrobials for a gram negative coverage, only use one. And if you have sepsis and septic shock where you don't think that there are uh, risk factors or you don't know about them, then they say again, you don't use a double uh, gram negative. What you do is run investigations, run a microbiological investigation, which means do a culture and sensitivity. And once you identify the pathogen and the sensitivity, then alone you decide whether you give single or double, because everything depends on the host, the bacteria, the antibiotics and all. Then comes this one. Okay. So the other question is, what about the antifungal and the antivirals? In the antifungal, again, they say that if you have a high risk of fungal infections, which again is the list of, uh, you know, we all know that, especially in patients who have got, say, for example, febrile neutropenia, in which you have given antibiotics for four or five days and the fever is still not coming down, or if you have a high prevalence, or if you have a a host where the other factors are there, which will put the patient to risk of fungal infection. Say, for example, a length of stay in the ICU, and he's still running infection, not responding to the antibiotics, where the culture shows that you know the, the antibiotics have a sensitivity for the bug. That is where you will give an empiric antifungal treatment rather than on no, no fungal treatment. But if you have a low risk, then the guidelines say do not use empiric uh, antifungals. For the viral, they have no recommendation because they say that the antiviral therapies are changing very fast and we have seen that in COVID, how fast they change. When it comes to the delivery, should we give a push or should we give a prolonged or extended uh, infusion? They are saying, please give extended one or a prolonged one over the conventional one. Everything we know with PKPD of sepsis patient and septic shock patients in the ICU is very different than what it is in the wards. So probably a prolonged infusion will be better. And there are studies which show that it is better in terms of the outcome. The PKPD, there are very few studies which tell us anything. In fact, we can resort to the therapeutic drug monitoring levels because that probably will tell us whether we are giving good enough or not. But the fact of the matter is, whatever we may say that PKP principles and specific drug properties is very difficult. So best is that you involve a um, infectious disease specialist rather than taking uh, you know, your own guess. Then comes the question of source control. Again, very simple. If you have an intravascular device, you have to take it out. If you are suspecting that to be the cause of infection, if there is there is an um, anatomical side, then you again have to do a source control by debridement, draining, or whatever. Then comes the de-escalation of antibiotics. Best is a daily assessment rather than using a fixed duration. And the, the, the guidelines do uh, cite you know, studies why they have come to this conclusion. But as you see, it remains a weak recommendation and a very low quality of evidence. Because usually what the practice is, once the patient gets better, that's when we decide that, okay, we will de-escalate rather than de-escalate as a planned activity. Then comes the duration. The, the, the guidelines say use shorter time for this because shorter time will give a lot of advantages to the patient. And this is part of the antimicrobial stewardship also. That is what the recommendation come and they sustain that recommendation coming in. When it comes to the biomarkers, look at these. This is to start and this is to discontinue. And this is where the guidelines say that you can rely on PCT and clinical where they were against it when it came to starting it, but they are okay with it when it comes to discontinuing with it because they feel that though the evidence is not very strong, PCT does not harm. But I don't know whether this is applicable to our country because PCT is, has a cost to it. Then comes some of the investigations where they are very clear, blood purification, they say don't use it. Other blood purification, they have no recommendations. Immunoglobulins, again, they recommend against it. Vitamin C, again, they say that you don't have to use. Now, let's quickly look at the differences between 2016 and 2021, because this is the update on the 2016. They have now said here, that you should have a standard operating procedures, which was missing in 2016. They had a screening, which they also have here, 
So this SOP has been added here. Then there comes the antimicrobials, and they say that you have to give one hour for whatever the reason, but the, here they have broken it up into definitive, possible, and low likelihood. And that is where they go on to three hours and no antibiotics. But out here, it was only one thing that you give it within one hour. Same is true when it comes to the MRSA. Previously, they said you give broad spectrum to cover all likely pathogens, which obviously includes the fungals and the MRSA and all. But here they are talking of the risk factors and they say if you have low risk factor, do not use MRSA coverage. The same is true for fungal. If you have low risk of fungal, do not use fungal coverage as per the guidelines. Hemodynamic monitors, just I'll quickly run through them. They say don't use saline. 2000 said you can use saline. They say don't use it. They said you prefer crystalloids over gelatins. And here they are saying don't use gelatins. They had no recommendation when it came to the blood purification. But out here, their, their recommendation is specifically again polymix and hemoperfusion. For the rest of the blood purification techniques, they are silent. They are saying we, even in 2021, they don't have a recommendation. In the 2016, what was missing and what has been added is a capillary refill time, which is a clinical bedside procedure. They, they suggest again levosimendan. And if your patient has got... Uh, arterial pressure normal and the uh, volume status is normal, then they say this is an inodilator. They say don't use it because it does not improve the outcomes. They are for starting a vasopressor peripherally rather than waiting for a central time, central line because it takes a lot of time and till that time the patient is without vasopressors. Initially 2016, we were scared that if you use peripheral uh, vasopressors, there may be limb ischemia. So that has been done with in the 2021, they have uh, insufficient when it come, evidence when it comes to restrictive versus liberal fluid. So how much fluid to give after 24 hours, they are, they are not very sure about that. And they say that, okay, fine, you give 30 bolus and within three hours, and then you can give one to four milligram per kg per hour, depending on the clinical uh, you know, assessment of the patients. They say and use high frequency nasal oxygen. This is FH, F, and no, I'm sorry for the mistake over the NIV, and they are against using the vitamin C. So in roughly, these, these are the salient points I wanted to bring out. I know I've rushed through, but you know, given the, the, given the time that it will require for me to kind of do the whole thing, I have only 20 minutes, and I hope I've done justice to this. So thank you very much. Um, I hope I have covered most of the salient points, especially the one which were with the um, infection part. So, Dr. Watal, thank you so much. I will stop sharing my slides. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rao. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rao. It was a pleasure, as usual, to listen to you. And I know you, you uh, treasure time. And uh, I had no worries as far as your presentation was concerned. Yeah, but I you, think made the jargon, you made the jargon so sound so simple when we know that they are really, you know, it days in and days out in ICUs, how you sweat it out. So thank you very much uh, uh, for this uh, lucid presentation. Though we had a very limited time, our aim is to have more of, of discussion at the end. And uh, now I uh, uh, I welcome at the same time, uh, Dr. Santhu Nambi, who has just joined us. Uh, and uh, Dr. Nambi, I have already introduced you. And in the meantime, I will uh, invite uh, my great friend, uh, Dr. Balaji from CMC Velour to go ahead with this presentation on diagnostic stewardship. Dr. Uh, Balaji, please. You are not audible. I can't be. Sure. Sorry. Your slide has been rung by the ear. Somebody has caught the ear of your uh, Now it is fine. Okay, sure, sir. Can you see the slide, sir? Yes. Uh, Please go ahead. So for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about the diagnostic stewardship, balancing the perils of sepsis and the AMR. I can easily say it's a double trouble. You have a sepsis to treat and the AMR to take care of. So uh, in the next 20 minutes, what I would like to touch upon is uh, four important areas. 
how to improve the positivity of the blood culture so as a microbiologist how we can help uh, educate the physician what we desire what they need to uh, fulfill second one is uh, how uh, we can uh, get the idea of the organism and the susceptibility testing at the earliest so i would like to talk about a new fda approved uh, antimicrobial susceptibility platform uh, which is expected to be a game changer then third one is what are the current understandings in the susceptibility testing of gram positive and gram negatives uh, it's a very few i can do share uh, uh, because of the time limitation and uh, the now with the availability of uh, new tools we we are encountering more of emerging pathogens what are all those emerging pathogens and how to take care of those pathogens what are the ideal appropriate therapy to uh, treat with so that's what i'm going to talk about in the emerging pathogen and what are all the new uh, existing uh, sepsis biomarker so uh, it's very clear that as many as 80% of the sepsis death could be prevented with the rapid diagnosis and appropriate treatment and uh, how rapidly you need to get the organism that's the question and the benchmark is very recently a paper has been published where they looked at the association between the time to appropriate antimicrobial treatment and 30 day mortality in patient with bloodstream infection it's a retrospective cohort study what they uh, observed is uh, the delay in appropriate antimicrobial treatment increases 30 day mortality after 12 hours from the blood culture collection so it looks that the benchmark is 12 hours once the blood culture is collected you need to give appropriate antibiotic within 12 hours and now the question is within 12 hours is it possible for you to get the blood culture what you have collected to become positive and have the identification and the ast now with the ever uh, modern uh, techniques i feel that we are moving towards reality where uh, within few years this is achievable and even now to small percentage within 12 hours positive identification of the culture and the susceptibility both is possible and the three important qualities of the microbiology lab is to get in a right specimen to get in a right specimen that is more important that will be the getting the right specimen is going to be the success of the microbiologist and for getting a right specimen they need to educate the physician what kind of uh, specimen they desire and once you get the specimen what is the appropriate testing platform you require so in blood culture related information i will be discussing subsequently and not only getting the right specimen and appropriate testing platform getting a accurate result in a shorter turnaround time is the best thing to happen so how to increase the blood culture sets and the volume Incre increasing the incremental yield okay so this is an, a very uh, nice important lesson which we learned from 2007 and it continues to be the same over the years in spite of conventional blood culture bottles turning out to be uh, modern uh, with the various uh, approaches of deduction with the high end tools but all the high end tools gets compensated with the antibiotic present in the blood so it's almost still we continue to have the same problem where if you are not collecting adequate blood culture sets and adequate volume you continue to miss 20 to 40% of septicemic patients with a single blood culture it's very important that two blood culture minimum has to be taken ideally the best is optimum is best is three look at this here each organism behaves differently and you need to have for certain organisms one culture may not be sufficient to show you few pseudomonas aeruginosa candida albicans coagulase negative staph enterococcus you need three blood cultures to achieve optimum 100% even then enterococcus will be left out you need to have four blood cultures so it's very vital if you do one then definitely 20 to 40% will be missed i uh, best is two ideally it's three so it's very important that number of sets is very particular next is with the paired culture set of set two sets 
what is the advantage you have advantage is definitely you will have an incremental yield second you can easily distinguish the skin flora from the pathogen that is commensal flora and the pathogen third is if it is an uh, <coughs> catheter linked a catheter a catheter linked uh, blood stream infection you can have the time to positivity and you can distinguish that one then accurate interpretation with the right diagnosis and appropriate therapy can be instituted this will save the cost of the antibiotic further investigation and the hospitalization so definitely a huge benefit you will win the if you have the right diagnosis you will win over everything and the second important is apart from the set number of blood cultures every blood culture drawn should be of adequate blood volume this is more important and what in day to day practice in velour we do is before dispatching the bottles to the ward we will enter we will weigh the bottle and we mark it in the sides of the the tube here and when the bottle returns with inoculated we minus this cap and calculate it and what we expect is if there is increase in the 1 mg then we know that 1 ml is extra so ideally whatever the ml we are required that much of milligram of weightage has to be gone up should have gone up so that's how we uh, uh, document this what we will do is we will follow up we will do the audit and we give the report to the quality maintenance cell and we pass on this information to the medical superintendent office if there is any action required uh, if we found any deficiency in filling up this bottle then they will be told to collect adequately the volume so because otherwise you no know, lot of money and effort is taken to get the right diagnosis if you don't uh, give right volume then effort money and the diagnosis is lost so we give great emphasis for the volume of the blood given into the bot uh, inoculated into the bottle and usually many centers i have seen they keep 5 ml syringe in the blood collection tray even 10 ml you cannot take 10 ml you land up taking 7 ml maximum 8 ml so it's always better to keep 20 ml syringe in the blood collection blood collection cal tray so that adequate volume is taken and in children put a direct butterfly to the blood culture bottle and collect and sometimes if you don't get access and if you find it difficult instead of inoculating into a set even one bottle is sufficient enough to give a good yield so now i move on to the gap between the identification of the organism and the susceptibility testing so we it's not in our control if you have a good uh, number of sets and good volume then the chances of uh, uh, bottles flagging positive are very high and the moment it flags positive and you all know that in a shorter period you can do the identification using various tools available now so usually it earlier it used to take 60 hours from the specimen collection and transport then the blood culture has to flag positive it will take overnight at least 24 hours in majority of the cases then subculture another day then the third day you get the id and fourth day you do the ast or it may be done within 3 days usually it is a practice of 3 days now we are trying to bring down this 3 day into a day where uh, put it in automated culture machine which flags positive somewhere any time between 6 to 24 hours and the moment it flags positive you have the white chemus prime or biofire to identify the organism in the next one hour time then the most important one which i would like to introduce are something called a breaking news i am going to tell about is a new tool which is available which has been fda approved couple of weeks back is specific reveal a uh, rapid antimicrobial susceptibility testing exclusively for gram negative bacteria and once you have the result with this tool then you initiate the target therapy so maldetoff yeah within uh, once it flags positive any time within 15 minutes to uh, 45 minutes you can have the organism identification done and now there are three other additional components are there where from the identification you can move on to uh, detect the susceptibility or the resistant gene one is called mbt star blsa where it picks up the beta lactamases and mbt resist assay which detects the resistant to protein biosynthesis and blocking antibiotics something uh, of of uh, macrolide and aminoglycoside class and then the third platform is mbt astra 
where this is semi quantitative growth assay using an internal standard where you can do for all antibiotics so using all these three component in a shorter period with accurate uh, detection of susceptibility or resistant can be made out so it's evolving and this will be in use uh, very widely in a uh, coming days and the other tool which is available currently in indian setting is biofilm array both for sepsis and as well as for the pneumonia so sepsis earlier it was uh, the marker was only for 27 targets now in the improvised version from 27 they moved to 43 targets you can look up the gram negative bacteria almost all it covers what can cause a sepsis and the gram positive bacteria almost most of the genus and species of common uh, sepsis are covered here including the yeast and this also adds up to the antimicrobial resistant esbl carbapenemase mrsa vancomycin resistance and the colostrum plasmid uh, mediated colostrum so bcid like again gives in a shorter period if there is a secondary bacteremia and respiratory infection even the respiratory infection can be picked up here we use for bacteria only for bacteria semi quantitative log bins are used i will explain this semi quantitative log bins whereas this is not possible for atypical bacteria that which is very only qualitative this is quantitative uh, for atypical bacteria qualitative includes chlamydia pneumonia legionella pneumophila and mycoplasma pneumonia and again only qualitative for viruses all the common viruses along with the bacteria for the respiratory specimens you can pick up uh, mrsa esbl and carbapenemase the most common ones and the, the sample has been validated with high sensitivity specificity from sputum epa and bronchoalveolar lavage so what is the semi quantitative log in bits look here so when you do specimens collection from the sputum ball or uh, uh, aspirate Uh, we do the real time pcr and you get a value unbuilt value of 10 to the power of 3.5 4.5 5.5 and 10, 10 to the power of 6.5 and this will be rounded up as a bin reporting value that is between 10.35 to 10 to the power of 4.5 it will be rounded as 10.4 below 10.4 it won't report it is uh, ignored or suppressed as commensal flora so which is insignificant thereafter continuously with the increase in the number of log copies it can be rebuilt so the idsa has defined the cut off of 10 to the power of 3.5 less is is considered as colonizer this is for acinetobacter baumeni you can see if it is more than 10 to the power of 7 your uh, percent of prediction bin precision is more than 100% and if it is dilution to again it's more than 100% and anything about 10 to the power of 5 is also 100% so if the dilutions with higher dilutions you get a high density then the precision goes higher so which has uh, this has been thoroughly evaluated and it gives an uh, sensitivity and positive predictive value of 96.2% with a specificity of 98.3% and for sputum it is 96.3 and 97.2% so this is the easy way to make out or to make out the pathogen and as well to differentiate between the colonizer and the pathogen now as i mentioned to you earlier this was a game changer new fda approved rapid antimicrobial susceptibility testing system which is called specific reveal so this is the peer review paper published recently and it has been published in journal of clinical microbiology this is performance of reveal rapid antibiotic susceptibility testing system only for gram negative blood culture at a large urban hospital and this kit has been couple of weeks back approved by fda the interesting aspect is once the blood culture bottle flags positive that is good enough no need to subculture on to the blood agar plate parallel you can do but for this particular test you no need to subculture or incubate further directly aspirate the supernatant inoculate into the pleuronic water you have to inoculate into the pleuronic water 5 ml of the supernatant to the blood uh, blood culture positive then uh, this 15 into the 15 ml clonical <coughs> conical flask and dilute it with the uh, 1 in 1000 dilution with the pleuronic water given by the company 
and pour it in a inoculator tray and collect 115 micro liters and put it in the tray and seal it push it into this machine and after within 5 hours you will get the result so the result is validated with an essential agreement of 98% with the sensitizer and the turnaround time is 5.5 hours so within 6 hours you are guaranteed to get a micro something similar to micro prop dilution exact mic values and the whole manual uh, handling uh, to process this specimen takes only 3 minutes the moment in the blood culture of uh, bottle flax positive okay how this happens uh, detection of volatile compounds emission during bacterial it's i won't say it is as a growth during bacterial death so the more number of cell death is proportional to the metabolic products arrived at so the more metabolic pro, uh, products are there then that the the curve will rise and for each color it denotes uh, various values 0.5 1 microgram per ml 2 4 8 16 and this is a negative control so this is the growth inhibition you can see the black is a positive control for growth inhibition and 0.5 highly susceptible one dark blue 2 micrograms and the green one is 4 microgram and the negative control is the yellow one so these are all the various colors formed on the tray and this colored uh, the color formation is read by the novel sensor technology based on its this color formulation which is due to the metabolic uh, product accumulated due to the cell death when antibiotic acts on the bacteria cell then the bacteria lysis or cell death occurs based on that product uh this uh, mic values are derived so uh, the great thing about this technique is within 5.5 hours you get an essential agreement of susceptibility with the sensitizer is almost 98% so getting within 6 hours of mic value is going to be a game changer and if the bacter alert flags positive within 6 hours with 6 or 12 hours the result will be ready or else since uh, most of the uh, identification system now we have is can pick up the id within 15 minutes to 3 hours so i will move on to current understanding in the susceptibility testing of gram positive and gram negative two things i would like to mention about the follow up of blood culture in staph aureus and how we can uh, avoid vancomycin especially for mrsa vascular endocarditis <coughs> there is an a recent study published where for for follow up of, i know we, we are we all must be sure that staph aureus bacteremia is a nightmare to manage for even for the infectious disease physicians once the blood culture is positive and the initiated therapy then you it is expected that the second day you will have the positivity coming down to 67 point and when you do on fourth day further it comes down to 48 5% and then it, uh, you need to keep doing follow up till it becomes negative then the day one of the therapy starts and other days are not counted so uh, they found out that based on the probability based optimization uh, model which they used they recommend that instead of one set doing two blood culture sets on day 2 and 4 after starting therapy may detect more than 90% of the persisting staph uh, staph aureus bacteremia and this will limit the skip phenomena and uh, second one is we always uh, depend more on vancomycin there is a nice article where it says that approaching 65 years is it time to consider retirement of vancomycin for treating mrsa due to endovascular infection you need to be not only for endovascular infection you can you can consider for bacteremia because vancomycin is a workhorse antibiotic for mrsa this was there in 65 years in the market and interestingly no reported resistant worldwide except 20 vrs vrs cases so it's going to be highly susceptible when you do in a microbiology lab and get the report however it's difficult to detect the visa so you land up getting a susceptible and mrsa persist and treatment failure with vancomycin are very high up to 20% failure vancomycin is a slow bactericidal poor diffusion into the tissue and another complicated is the nephrotoxicity which goes up to 35 you need to do a therapeutic drug monitoring 
and no more uh, trough level is uh, recommended. You need to do the AUC by MIC 400-2515. So instead of depending more on vancomycin, for any serious infection, always provide susceptibility information for daptomycin and levonadifloxacin, ceftrolin, and then comes vancomycin. So it's very imperative that I know vancomycin, it's MIC related. And if you fail, uh, if you are depending only on vancomycin, then is the opportunity to treat with better antibiotics. Now I move on to the gram negatives. And you need to understand the difference between E. coli and Klebsiella pneumonia. Two are totally uh, different uh, entity or personality. And hypervirulent hypermucoviscosis are very high now in numbers with Klebsiella pneumonia. The earlier gram negative sepsis, highly virulent with high mortality, was E. coli. Now the trend is changing. It happens to be more of a Klebsiella pneumonia. ESBL rates are very high with E. coli, little lesser with Klebsiella. And uh, Cryptazo resistant is very high with E. coli, that is 63% because of the OXA1 presence. The OXA1 is not present much in the Klebsiella pneumonia. So, Cryptazo's effect is much better with Klebsiella than with the E. coli. Resistant to carbapenem is low with the E. coli, however, it's very high with Klebsiella pneumonia, it's almost 50%. Here, the predominant uh, drug resistant mechanism for E. coli is NDM, very little with OXA48. Here, the OXA58 is the big one. Standalone 20% combined with the NDM again 18%. So almost uh, for alone 40% OXA48 is present. And uh, the interesting another new uh, add on to the injury is PB3 insert, which is seen in almost all the E. coli, mainly in carbapenem resistant E. coli. That is not reported in club cell pneumonia. So it's becoming more challenging to treat carbapenem resistant E. coli. The septazidine AV bactam is not going to work in carbapenem resistant E. coli with the PB3. Cephidorocolexol may, uh, uh, may not respond as desired. Cephipime tinyborbactam, another problem we are having because of the NDM PB3 combination. So, both the highly uh, expect promising drugs are not going to be very promising. And now, uh, what the last one year, the septazidine may be back to muscionum combination seems to be very promising and we have never come across any resistant to this combination. But slowly over the last few weeks, we were started seeing uh, this uh, uh, synergy coming down for this uh, combination. Septazidine may be back to muscionum. Cholesterol resistant is 8% and the is seems to be much better alternative for E. coli. Uh, so vice versa, NDM mediated resistant to cephidorocol is very low still. Cephidorocol and cephipime tinyborbactam seems to be better for Klebsiella pneumonia. The best one, astrona may be bactam combination. Unfortunately, the coristin rates for uh, carbapenem resistant Klebsiella is high. And a little bit about PB3, you can see that this can be detected using the multiple mom, uh, sorry multiplex mama PCR, where you can pick up the single point mutation. We are using this target. And not all the PB3 positive E. coli harbor NDM, but almost all the NDM co-harbors PB3 insertion. So if you have a combination of NDM, PB3 and MPC, it's something very difficult to treat. So, so it will be very challenging and the PB3 modification really results in compromise, the loss of activity of Piprazilin, Ceftazidum, Ceftalozine, Astronom, Ceftazidum may be bactum, Astronom may be bactum, Cephidorocol and Cephipime tinybor bactum mainly for E. coli, not for any other organism. Now, uh, a note for the microbiologists. Look here, there are many number of uh, literature on uh, doing the synergy testing for astronom, sorry, for septazid may be bactam and astronom. Though the gold standard is microbroth dilution, uh, many places they do with the E-test strip. Of the E-test strip, the best one happens to be the strip cross method than the strip stacking method. We can see the sensitivity specificity here and the sensitivity specificity here. So the cross is better. And this was one of the landmark study which many people are following. But always the better is the BMD gold standard. And another one which has been published in the Journal of Global Antimicrobial Resistance is, again, the disk diffusion method with the poor sensitivity and specificity the results are qualitative, not quantitative. This is very important. And here they use fixed concentration of astronom of 30 micrograms and the false synergy and the false resistant are very high. So it's better to avoid. 
then another one with uh, they have evaluated three different methodologies but unfortunately there is a issue of methodology and interpretations are there and moreover all these methods have not been compared with the gold standard microbroth dilution and uh, third the problem is there is an, a reduction in the astronom mic uh, which should be considered rather than septazidine avibactam because here for us we would like to know the preserve how this astronom is protected against the metal of beta lactamase and uh, i keep telling in various meetings again it's very important to understand that synergy is not equal to susceptibility we need to achieve both synergy and susceptibility look here i have given two examples uh, individually septazidim is 256 astronom is 128 when you join together you achieve uh, septazidim maybe back to astronom as bringing coming down to 2 where 16 fold reduction is there so this is the best example for synergy and susceptibility here you see from 256 it has come down to 16 uh, four fold decrease is there but still the 16 has not fallen below 4 you need to have less than 4 because that is the break point for astronom so here in this thing we are looking for the protection of astronom so it's very important the fall of fold decrease in the mic should be either 4 or below 4 okay now we have done a phosphomycin susceptibility against uh, e coli with the ndm and pb3 and uh, with this combination we found phosphomycin seems to be much much uh, highly susceptible this all pink ones are susceptible violet is intermediate sorry white is susceptible uh, violet is intermediate and the pink is resistant and you can see for all the organism including septazidine mevibactam and astrona mevibactam the resistant are very high whereas phosphomycin is highly susceptible and uh, watch out for uh, difficult to treat arginosa the percentage is going up over the years we earlier what was 20% now i see the national average of 35% the difficult to treat uh, pseudomonas arginosa is defined as resistant to preprazolin tazobactam septazidine cefepime astronom miropenem imipenem seroxin and ciprofloxacin and the newer agents also not very effective because in our pseudomonas arginosa in addition to porin and deflux we have 30% of metallo beta lactamase the last uh, portion is we do have lot of intrinsically resistant carbapenem as an emerging pathogens one is burkholderia cinosebacea this doesn't have much of an a problem it's highly susceptible but it's an emerging pathogen burkholderia cinosebacea complex but other four are metallo beta lactamase uh, resist metallo beta lactamase producing where it's intrinsically resistant to carbapenem stenotrophomonas maltophila elizabeth kinge chryzobacteria species acromobacter and alkaligens this is uh, acquired the rest three are intrinsic so uh, it's very challenging to treat this uh, four organisms and uh, the these are all the resistant mechanism this for this five organisms and the common one which can knock off all this uh, unusual or emerging organisms is the trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole for burkholderia cinosebacea complex this seems to be the best one trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole again for stenotrophomonas maltophila and for chryzobacterium and so for all this it's there whereas for elizabeth kinge combination of drugs are recommended that includes trimethoprim either with minocycline or minocycline with moxi or with rifampicin any of the two can be given uh, even uh, vancomycin is suggested even though in vitro it's a uh, resistant but in vivo they think that vancomycin also help in this so these are all the emerging pathogens with the intrinsic carbapenem resistant except burkholderia cinosebacea and uh, my last portion is sepsis biomarker especially i would like to address uh, more than the infection marker the acute kidney injury marker and vascular integrity as a holistic microbiologist also should look at the I would like to have an uh, sepsis lab where you need to correlate the infection with the pro, uh, with the other markers uh, and give the holistic picture to the physicians or it should be in the same uh, sheet where both can exchange definitely the procalcitonin marker uh, is markedly elevated in severe sepsis and moderately elevated in respiratory but not in other uh, uh, 
uh, syndromes. So you need to be very clear that in the severe sepsis, it will be very market, uh, marked and uh, very high and even the respiratory also, it will be very high compared to any other thing. Though the procalcitonin is very clearly said, it will be useful only for uh, uh, de-escalating the antibiotics. And the CRP, it's a non-specific, it falls down whether the procalcitonin continues to be the high. And uh, the another new uh, kit in the market, in the public uh, for a dispense it's available is the detection of presence of insulin-like growth factor binding protein 7 and tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinase, which is uh, just, uh, as a high 91 positivity, it's uh, detected from the urine so specimen and the predictive of uh, AKI. Uh, this is another promising one and uh, uh, we are expecting this to be uh, very shortly included in the guidelines. Look at this, the acute kidney injury occurs in 30 percent. Balaji, sorry interrupting you. Okay, sir. Sure, I'll finish the last slide. So this particular marker is uh, useful to detect earlier than creatinine, at least 24 to 32 hours earlier than to creatinine. And this will give the indication for early diagnosis. And you can see if it is uh, the, if it is low, the survival rate is very high, 86%. And if it is very high, then the survival rate is only 56%. And the value is, cutoff value is 100 picomoles. And the last one is bioadrenomedulin, where this is indicates the biomarker for vascular and endothelial integrity. And this will help you to initiate the vasopressor. Fluids, anyhow, you will be giving. When to start the vasopressor, this gives an indication. And this has a monoclonal antibody, which will help the patient to recover fast. This is pending FDA approval. Only limitation is this uh, levels will go high. Bioadrenal model level will be high even in cardiogenic shock and acute heart failure. So you need to distinguish between the cardiac pathology and sepsis. So it's a good marker for prediction, diagnosis, and monitoring. Thank you, sir. Sorry for exceeding few minutes. Thank you, Dr. Balaji. It was really very, very much interesting as it is, but unfortunately, due to lack of time, I had to interrupt you in between. Sorry for that. Dr. Rao also has to leave at 5.30. I would uh, like now immediately to go to Dr. Uh, Senfu Nambi to go ahead with this presentation. Dr. Nambi, please. Uh, very good evening, uh, Dr. Bartel. I uh, hope my screen is visible. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me here. And uh, I think I'm not sure what I'm going to add after a long, uh, exhaustive lecture by Dr. Balraji. But let me try my bit. And uh, things look very easier. Uh, the question is, does your patient have infection or not? Uh, no infection or no bacterial infection, no antibiotic. And when there is a bacterial infection, you need to give antibiotic. So it's quite simple looking at these three lines, but uh, to make the decision at the bedside is the real challenge. In any patient with fever, uh, we need to understand that antibiotics are not magic bullets. We need to ask us of this question, uh, any infectious disease problem has two components. Uh, what is the syndrome or where is the problem? When you can probably figure it out clinically or based on examination or lab tests or radiology, where is the problem, then you can predict what is the microbial etiology. Of course, you need a, a laboratory support to understand what could be the microbial etiology and the susceptibility profiles so that you can choose the right drug. And uh, undifferentiated fevers are a very important component in the evaluation of sepsis in ICU and in Indian ICUs, definitely. There's a huge list of uh, uh, diseases for that. At times, it becomes a little easier when we have a localization like pneumonia, or an abdominal infection, meningoencephalitis, or a urinary tract infections. So we need to have this basic understanding before even seeing our patients. I would just go through some uh, real life case scenarios, plus what, our, what has been our learning points uh, with respect to the newer technologies. This is a diabetic male with poor control, uh, presents with the left leg swelling and pain for two days duration. Obviously the leg is not looking good and um, it looks like a complicated uh, skin and soft tissue infections. You can see this uh, violaceous bullet. A uh, patient is in the ICU on anotropes, he's intubated, he's on a ventilator, he's about to be dialyzed. So uh, skin and soft tissue infection with sepsis, um, they're trying to cover gram-positive infections, 
uh, streptococcus pyogene, staph aureus, plus gram negatives, like E. coli, Klebsiella kind of things. Since the patient was sick, he was started on mirapenem and vancomycin. And uh, the blood cultures uh, the next day, within 12 hours, had flogged gram positive cocci, good volume blood cultures, all four bottles growing gram positive cocci. This was in 2015 16, and this was a sick patient in the ICU with a gram positive cocci in the uh, blood culture and a soft tissue infections. Probably we are thinking at Streptococcus pyogenes and Staph aureus, but we did have this. Uh, panel, the blood culture identification panel one, the version one, and you could see that uh, moment the blood culture was flagged, we had asked for this report and what uh, we could identify that it was Staphylococcus aureus and the MECA gene was not detected. So MECA gene not detected means that it is not MRSA. So we could have that report. So the diagnosis of methicillin sensitive Staph aureus bacteremia with septic shock was made on day one itself, that is on uh, day zero and after that 12 hours later. So we've had an etiological diagnosis within 24 hours. The drug of choice for uh, methicillin sensitive staph aureus, MSSA is as bad as MRSA or at times it can even more worse. So we had actually started this patient on vancomycin meropenem. Uh, they are not the most appropriate agents for MSSA. Moment you know it is MSSA, you are going to give either fluclocsicillin or cefazolin. Vancomycin was stopped at 24 hours. Another 24 hours, we waited for the blood cultures. There are no more else flags. Mirapenem was stopped. The traditional testing, yes, it is very, very useful, but still it picked up uh, the same MSSA at around the day three, 72 hours. So that's the value of having a test that would uh, uh, give you information very quick in a critically ill sick patient. And um, these are uh, initial analysis of the blood culture identification panel one, the version one, for the initial 36 isolates when we had analyzed uh, about its impact versus the conventional traditional method of microbiology testing. This is way back in 2015-16. What we found that the BCID-1 was very useful with gram-positive organisms. When you have a gram-positive flagging in the blood, uh, it had all the enough information that is required, both with respect to staph aureus and enterococci. As with gram negatives, it didn't have a lot of information that is required with respect to carbapenem resistance and all those things. So it was lagging with the gram negative bit, but nevertheless, the information time gap is, was quite, um, quite the turnaround time or the information that you would get when this test was used in an appropriate scenario was actually very, very short when compared to the traditional uh, cultures. And then we had this test, the expert Kaba R, uh, which was looking into these um, five key carbapenemases with respect to the gram negatives and more so with applying to the enterobacteriaceae E. coli Klebsiella. And uh, after the BCID1, we started using this. We realized that the gram negatives were the problem in our ICU. And um, when we had used this test in our ICU as a routine for all, all our gram negative bacteremias, uh, especially in critically ill ICU patients or post-transplant patients, where the information that we are going to get out of it is going to be very, very crucial. We were in for a surprise. Uh, till this point of time, at this point of time, we are thinking that all we had was only NDMs in our scenario. And that, that was a time when we had data emerging from CMC saying that there could be OXA in India. And to our surprise, what we found in our ICU in Apollo Chennai was 50% of the enterobacteria that we had were all OXA producers. 33% were pure NDM producers, and then a 15% had NDM plus OXA. And uh, this was with respect to around 120 bacteremic isolates. And it was kind of an eye opener for us to make us understand that we do have OXA in our uh, ICUs. And we found that OXA production quite common in Klebsiella, whereas the NDM production was quite common with E. coli. And OXA, moment you see an OXA, then right now we have information to say that a drug like Keftazidim Abibactam could work well for that. And then we had this refined version. Dr. Balaji has already projected this, the BCID2, which is a kind of a modified version looking into cholesterol resistance plus the kaba penemases. Whatever that was there in the kaba R is incorporated into the BCID2. And now it has become a practice in our critically ill ICU patients with gram negatives or gram positive flags in our blood cultures. We do it as a routine. And this was in a patient with cholangitis 
and has a gram negative bacteremia. With cholangitis, we are looking at general E. coli Klebsiella. Whereas in this patient, what it could be picked up was Klebsiella, and uh, the genes that were detected was CTXM correlating with ESBL production. And then we had OXA48 uh, correlating with Cabapenem um, uh, uh, there. So when you have this kind of information, uh, probably we can narrow down the therapy to keftazidim, abibactam, something like that. And you may not resort to polymyxin or colistin like that. So it's very useful in your critically ill patient uh, ICU as well as in post-transplant patients are immune compromised post. And um, this is again looking into the utility of this uh, blood culture identification panel 2 or BCID2. And uh, but the most important thing is you need good volume blood cultures to start and then uh, the blood cultures have to flag, and then you need to do a stain, and then from that you process further. The, the time to blood culture flagging, what we found is around uh, 22 hours. Moment it flags, we have a request raised from the clinician for a blood culture identification two panel. So the sample gets transported to our uh, molecular lab from the microbiology lab, and from that you get the report in one to two hours. So the sequence goes like that. A patient right now at 5.30 p.m. gets admitted in our hospital in the emergency. We do blood cultures whenever there is sepsis is suspected. Patient goes to the ICU next day. At morning 10 o'clock, we have a blood culture reading saying that it is flagged. Then we request uh, for the BCID uh, panel to be raised on that. And by around 12 p.m. or 1 p.m. during our rounds time, we'll have the information. There is a traditional method where we do have Molitov in our system. It does help us, but still with this, you are going to cut short this um, process by using a film array uh, BCID2. Uh, it's costly in terms of cost, but definitely very useful for critically ill patients in our ICU, especially when you have gram negatives, where the therapy is going to be of uh, great importance. And um, when we compare with the uh, conventional methods, so the initial 30 blood culture flags, whatever we could see, eight samples had uh, concordance with the uh, BCID. And right now we are evaluating the next 200 uh, uh, samples. Uh, we will have that information on that in the next uh, two months. One sample which flagged gram negative later group Acromobacter. Burkholderia sepatia was identified as can Canada peropsilosis. That is one problem with the BCID too. It does not have Burkholderia that. And um, Rosiomonas and the blood culture did not show any identification on the blood culture identification panel. And uh, what we found was modification of the antibiotics was done in 50% of the occasions. And it was almost done a day earlier when this test was used. De-escalation was done on two occasions. And another times you had used an alternative agents. So it does help in kind of choosing the appropriate antimicrobial at least a day earlier when this test is done. So more valuable in your critically ill ICU patient. And all the more, uh, when you have newer agents like Keptazidim uh, which will be a very good drug for uh, the OXA48 uh, producing Klebsiella and E. coli. And then with NDM, if you're going to look into the synergy aspect, then this information that you would get it from molecular testing like that would be very, very useful. Even in case you don't have molecular testing, I don't think we need to worry about it. All you need is a traditional microbiology lab with good testing methodology for these individual molecules. So even if you do not have these BCID2 or the CABA arts, all we need is a routine microbiology lab, which could test for Keptazidim abibactam for the E. coli and Klebsiella and let us know. But with these molecular tests, the information turnaround time is much, much, much quicker. The traditional uh, labs, we are looking at day three, day four interface, whereas with molecular tests, we're looking at day one, day two interface. This is a 30-year-old female with community-acquired pneumonia, and you have YBSL infiltrates, and uh, this is COVID era. So whenever you do a CT scan, all you have is uh, reporting in terms of COVID, Corats 5 with some scoring, and you got a CT severity score of 8 by 25. So this was uh, declared as COVID pneumonia by the radiologist looking into the CT scan. Uh, but the COVID PCR done on this patient was negative twice. The white cell count was normal. The sputum and blood cultures is negative. So this is a community acquired pneumonia, uh, which the radiologist thinks is COVID pneumonia, but your COVID PCR has been done uh, twice negative. This is something that we had seen in, this is on 1st of August, 
a month ago we had seen in Chennai. So what was thought to be COVID is actually not COVID. And what we have is actually influenza A, H1, uh, 2009 uh, version of the influenza A, H1N1. So it's very important to use these tests to know when you think it is not going in your expected lines. All viral pneumonias are not COVID. We do have other viruses as a cause for pneumonias and influenza is something that not to be forgotten. And uh, this was our experience with the initial H1N1 PCR from the year 2013 to 2016. All we had was only H1N1 in uh, Chennai and uh, all we have the data is with respect to H1N1. And uh, when we started using this uh, molecular or multiplex PCR systems, what we realized that in the year 2016-17, the blue bars, actually the blue line uh, represents H1N1. But in that year, we did have a peak of H3 also. So if not for this multiplex PCR test, you would have not even known that uh, we had H3 into among our scenario. So that is the utility of all these tests in trying to understand uh, in addition to the routine, it's important that we understand that we have other viruses, other influenza viruses like H3N2 and influenza B amongst us. And, um, and when you incorporate uh, the information that you get from all these things into a clinical practice, and if you look into the impact that we've had on a respiratory viral panel is antibiotics were stopped in one third of the patients after the diagnosis of viral infections. These were de-escalated to a narrow spectrum agent in one third. So in almost 60% of that, and you know that it was a viral pneumonia, we could have a change or stop in antibiotics. And that is very crucial when using all these tests. And uh, going on to the meningitis or the meningoencephalitis, which is a common ICU uh, scenario. And this is looking to the meningoencephalitis panel that we have used. Uh, in the initial 90 patients, then we had analyzed what we found that is, it was not useful with our chronic meningitis, whereas with our acute meningoencephalitis, which was very, very useful in picking up a recovery in respect to etiology with our acute uh, meningoencephalitis thing. And uh, look into our uh, publication on the microbial etiology of community acquired meningoencephalitis in adults, you would have a big number for pneumococcus where we have around 17 patients with pneumococcus being picked up as a cause for acute meningoencephalitis. And in that 17 patients picked up by the molecular test, only two had a CSF bacterial cultures positive. So that is a value of using a multiplex PCR methodology. And these information that you get for these critically ill patients in ICU is very, very crucial. And um, otherwise, the traditional pneumococcus methodology, the bacterial culture, CSF, picked up only in two out of uh, the 17 patients, whereas the molecular test was good enough to pick up as pneumococcus is the commonest cause for acute meningoencephalitis in our uh, scenario. It's a Swedish national who's touring India, has uh, a Chennai belly syndrome, why call only Delhi belly syndrome, Chennai belly syndrome. Uh, odd thing is he presents with an uh, colitis, but you could see a platelet count of 3,000 and his the white cell count was around 20,000. People were thinking in terms of uh, HUS TTP syndrome. And um, he was in the ICU because his relatives were critically low and he was definitely in uh, sepsis. And the GA panel picked up Campylobacter, very useful information in these kind of patients, uh, which is which can create a lot of uh, noise than the music, but still it is very useful when compared to the traditional uh, methods. If you could see in around 100 patients with uh, diarrhea, the traditional method picked up only in five patients, whereas the panel picked up in around uh, 50 patients out of 100, almost 50% pick up rate, whereas the traditional method were picked up only in 5%. So this routine stool cultures uh, have an abysmal poor performance, poor performance when compared to the uh, multiplex PCI method. And you have a variety of pathogens starting from E. coli, uh, enterotoxigenic, EPEC, norovirus, Campylobacter. And this is one test that oh, you would not get disappointed by doing it. And uh, we would reserve it for uh, diarrhea and immunocompromised host or chronic diarrhea, diarrhea and HIV host. 
otherwise not for the routine acute diarrheal uh, illness. So all these molecular tests have their own plus and minus. Uh, the pros would be an enhanced etiologic diagnosis, valuable in patients who are critically ill and who are in ICU post-transplant, but at times they can pick up more noise than the music. Uh, and the ease of doing it is much, much better. And uh, there is, it's much more costly uh, and availability is again a problem. And uh, it aids in hospital infection control. That way it is very, very crucial. If you're going to pick up influenza A, H3, yes, you need the patient on a Doppler isolation. It helps in antimicrobial stewardship. And uh, But the drug susceptibilities are not available. That would be one disadvantage with that. And we need to Indianize it because all these are all Western, um, uh, Western panels. Probably when we have something Asian or Indian, it would be even more good. For example, with the meningitis encephalitis, I would like to have the dengue, chicken, munya, West Nile virus, all those things. And the cost in the long run uh, for your ICU patient, even though it, it is thought as a negative one, but perhaps if you look into the antibiotic cost, the hospital infection control impact, and in fact, the cost could actually prove to be its advantage. So it's a balance between uh, what you can afford or what the patient can afford, or what the hospital can afford, but nevertheless, very useful in... Uh, Critically ill patients are immune compromised force. Uh, let it be the blood culture identification. I think the information that you get is very, very crucial. Early days in India, probably another two, three years, we'll have a lot of data. Meningitis encephalitis panel, no doubts asked at all. Pneumonia panel, I think it is still uh, in the uh, el elementary stage. That is how I put pneumonia panel. GA panel, useful in immune compromised force. And uh, way ahead, I think there's a lot of um, uh, exciting things. I'm not sure. How, would, how well will it, will it come into practice? There is artificial intelligence uh, for clinical decision support in sepsis, where you could have mission-based learning algorithms. There could be nanotechnology uh, into the diagnosis of sepsis. Looks exciting. And uh, you could have uh, data management systems like uh, this one, uh, Myla, which is sponsored by BioMeru. And uh, it could be exciting, but uh, integrating that into our practice will be the uh, key challenge. And uh, I think the last couple of my slides, um, I know that I am supposed to speak on technology and advancements, uh, but by heart, I'm a kind of a very basic individual and uh, I am a old fashioned guy. And I, I think um, I had used this and most of uh, the learned people here, I'm not sure if the newer ones uh, in the microbiology will they know about this, but the older ones will know about this, the relationship between the pencil and the uh, audio tape that we have. And I think the future ahead is, I think the traditional conventional microbiology is here to stay. I don't think, I cannot see the world without the traditional microbiology, but we need to have mixed the tradition with the modern. We have to be much more open in uh, accepting and adopting uh, modern technologies, but the tradition remains, uh, the conventional microbiologists, the microbiology techniques will always remain, but we may have to mix uh, uh, do a, a mix of both. I think that's my last slide. Uh, I think I finished with my 20 minutes time. Thank you. The phone button, sir. Uh, Wonderful uh, listening to you, Dr. Nambi. And uh, these are some of the exciting uh, things that one sees as a microbiologist when you are trying to uh, get at the diagnosis right away when uh, we are scratching our head and some of the very difficult diagnosis like compilobacter and things like that. You usually do not, you are not able to diagnose the routine bacteriology uh, as it is. We are flooded with uh, uh, questions as it is. So there are some basic things that have been uh, still asked, but I'm sure these have also been uh, asked already. There is a uh, Dr. Deepak, uh, Deepika Gan, uh, Ganveer from Bangalore who still wants to know about CRP. Dr. Rao, if you are there, is it possible that you uh, make it still more clear? Dr. Rao, are you there? Dr. Nambi, you could take it up in the meantime. That's a CRP that we have. What? Uh, how do you rate it even now? I, I think CRP is not routinely used in adult ICUs. Even though pediatricians and PICUs still they are used. Uh, I would see it as a poor cousin to procalcitonin. Uh, but with COVID being back, there was a renewed interest with uh, CRP yes. where it was seen as an exclusive biomarker with respect to COVID activity. Uh, mm -hmm. I think if you can afford procalcitonin, 
I think it's a much better biomarker than CRP for an, an average adult patient. Uh, yes, I agree with you. And uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Balaji, you want to add anything to it? Nothing. Have sir. you found anything great in CRP? No, CRP, nothing. Sir. Other than COVID? Nothing, nothing. Sir. Nothing really. So, uh, there's a gentleman, uh, Raja Ray from Calcutta. He's uh, interested in WGS as compared to phenotypic AST in antimicrobial studies. What's the role of uh, WGS as compared to the phenotypic AST in uh, antimicrobial studies? It's not going to be available in uh, real time. And second thing is, it tells about the resistance, not the susceptibility. Yes, so, uh, yes that's right. And Dr. Mathi, Soro Mathi again from Kolkata, he is uh, very keen to know, he has written it twice, that uh, any role of antibiotics in non-bacterial sepsis. When he says non-bacterial sepsis. Non -bacterial, and he, he has asked this question twice. So I do not know what was his, his mind. Are we missing something uh, that he is trying to imagine? When you said it's a non-bacterial, we, we said right in this first slide that if it is uh, not bacterial, so what do we do with the antibiotics over there? So, Dr. Nambi, you want to add anything? I, I think probably what he would have meant is someone presenting with dengue and sepsis-like syndrome, something like that. So, I think if we are very clear regarding if there is no bacterial cause for infection and we have a clear alternative explanation like malaria, dengue, influenza, COVID, even though the patient is septic, I don't think we should be using antibiotics. Empirically is fine, pending blood cultures, 48 to 72 hours, good volume blood cultures, or representative cultures, even in patients with proven uh, viral infections like dengue, influenza, COVID, or parasitic infections like malaria. I think for 48 hours to 72 hours, the cultures are negative. I think we, sh we should not be continuing antibiotics any further. Yeah, in such case of, cases of non-bacterial uh, uh, kind of uh, fever, as it is, Dr. Rao, you are... In yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. now I, I managed to unmute myself, yeah. So regarding the CRP, it is an acute yeah. reactant, but it doesn't really help us. Yeah, that's what my other two panelists were saying. Yes, it and, doesn't uh, help me at all in terms of planning yeah. the treatment. Absolutely, absolutely. That's uh, very right. And the non-bacterial sepsis, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Nambi explained, in dengue and uh, chikungunya and this kind of infections or even H1N1, if you are having fever and uh, you are having the kind of difficulty in uh, uh, helping the patient, antibiotics probably uh, may not do much good. And uh, I'll, I do not know if uh, he was uh, thinking of super added infection. It is a very common story that is related that this patient will get into uh, super added infection, has uh, uh, you know uh, some of the risk factors and that kind of a scenario. Does it still warrant an antibiotic? Dr. Nami or Dr. Rao? I think we need to go by the temporal profile of the course. Whereas with dengue, you don't have any secondary infections. That's not possible. Malaria, very, very rarely you have secondary infections. Uh, influenza is one example where you could have secondary bacterial infections, typically with staph aureus or pneumococcus or hemophilus influenza. But that generally happens in the second week or third week. COVID, uh, anyone who is not intubated, ventilated, they rarely develop secondary bacterial infections. But in the ICU on a ventilator, uh, that the, every passing day on a ventilator, there is always a risk of a uh, uh, new infection happening. But as such, uh, COVID, if the steroid is used, there is a risk of secondary bacterial infection. But for, to prevent that risk, I don't think we are going to give antibiotics. <laughs> Only when we clinically think there is a new event or there is some bacterial evidence of bacterial infection, that is when we should be using antibiotics, definitely not as a routine. Dr. Watson, the practice is very, very varied. You know, some yes. people can kind of be, are, are very proactive, they use it. Some people don't. But the fact of the matter is, whether you do it or you don't, you will still get infections because it is the infection control practices which matter. If you yeah. don't practice them, then dump them any with any antibiotic, they will still have infections. Mm. Well, I, I agree, agree with you. There's one gentleman from Dhaka, uh, Dr. Azilul Haq, who now wants to know about invasive fungal detection rates in hospitals. Any one of you wants to pick it up? Invasive Dr. fungal. You you can tell us about Gangaram because you you will be knowing it. 
Yeah, invasive fungal detection uh, rates in hospitals, we are primarily, if you are talking about, is candida and aspergillus. You know, those these are the two fungi that are uh, uh, quickly picked up by a large. And uh, uh, what is happening in the pulmonary situation, the aspergillus uh, is being picked up if there is a fungal ball or things like that. And if you are using some of the biomarkers and the biomarkers like beta D glycon along with the galactomannan, it does give some idea as to what's going on. And there are publications which also support if you add it with a PCT and you do galactomannan, it gives you some idea whether it is a bacterial infection going on or the fungal infection going on because of the deep uh, seated fungi. And uh, beta D uh, glucon also gives you an idea as to what is going on as far as the fungal is concerned with uh, invasive candida infections and the uh, uh, invasive aspergillosis and some of the more uh, mycelial fungi that also it can uh, pick up other than blastomyces and cryptococcosis. So these are some of the uh, biomarkers that can help. And uh, if you are able to get some of the tissue biopsies or the bronchoalveolar lavage, you may try and pick up some of the fungi as it is in blood culture. I don't know if Balaji will agree that we pick up a good amount of candida infections when we are talking about blood cultures, particularly in the pediatric group of uh, patients or in transplant patients or with comorbid conditions. Dr. Balaji, you want to add? No, sir. Oh, I agree with whatever you said. That's the same picture we do see here in Bellore. Yeah. So uh, that's the, one of the questions also that another gentleman had asked from uh, uh, Lucknow that role of procalcone in, in uh, fungal sepsis, and uh, this could be also uh, again by negative productivity value. You may try and say that is it uh, favoring more the fungal infection or there is a bacterial infection if you are strong advocatory of uh, procalcitonin, which Dr. Rao showed that procalcitonin is not supported for the diagnosis of uh, bacterial infection, but for de escalation, probably it may be of uh, some use. Not, 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 not for the diagnosis, for starting for the, the antibiotics. For, yes. But that, yeah, because it does differentiate between bacterial and all, a bacterial and fungal or viral. But the point is, I have better tests. You know, if, if I want to rule out bacterial, I have better tests. If I want to rule out fungal, I have other tests also. I mean, I will not rely totally on the PCT as a single test. But uh, there is a uh, Dr. Rodriguez from Panjam who wants to know that with the advancing hospital care approach, has sepsis incidents come down? Dr. Vatan, uh, the incidents, uh, my feeling is that it may be marginally down, but the mortality has come down. With the mortality has come down. Care, the mortality has come down. That may be multifactorial. Maybe that I will try and... Uh, uh, lean towards the early diagnosis, probably with the newer techniques. Yeah, whole yes. whole lot of things. Whole, whole lot, lot of things. Even together. even better patient care. Dr. Nambi, I, I, I am not you? sure. Uh, I'm not sure if we have any kind of overall data with respect to sepsis incidents. Uh, but I do agree there is much better awareness, uh, very good treatment approaches, critical care. Uh, that all those things have had a definite impact on the overall mortality. Uh, that's for sure, without any doubt. Yeah, I agree. Uh, from uh, Chennai, uh, Dr. Arthi K wants to know, Balaji, you could uh, cater it. What is the exact use of anaerobic bottle? If only one bottle can be given, which is preferred, aerobic or anaerobic. So though you have explained in detail the use of more than one bottle, but she still is haggling with an anaerobic bottle. Sometimes uh, uh, anaerobic, it's, since the majority of the isolates are facultative anaerobic, so uh, little earlier than the facultative bottle, that uh, anaerobic bottle will flag positive and uh, incremental increase will be there. And uh, you are sure that the colonizer won't appear in both the sets. Pathogen will be there very often. So that are, these are all the few advantages we have. Sir. Yes, I agree with you. That's... Uh the facultative anaerobes may probably grow better. We do find sometimes anaerobic bottle bleeps positive in Klebsiella pneumonia as compared to the routine aerobic bottle. That that would be one of the only areas where we may say, okay, fine, you may pick up an anaerobic bottle as well and add to the kind of isolation rate. Now, the difficult question as it is from Kochi, 
Dr. Molly uh, uh, Johnny, who is actually uh, perturbed with Klebsiella pneumoniae PDR sepsis, and he wants to know from uh, all of you as to how does he treat. You have shown so many plethora of antibiotics also that you have some kind of uh, action, and whether these are available in the country or not, how do do, do you treat a PDR sepsis with Klebsiella pneumoniae? So, Senthur, you could start, and Balaji could add from his armamentorium that he showed. Um, I think if there is any source control to be done, uh, if it is a device-associated thing, uh, for example, a central line or a urinary catheter, I think we need to do that first. And then probably the treating clinicians should pray to God, as well as ask the attenders <laughs> also to pray to God. And then uh, look into the beta lactam MICs, the MIC cutoff and the actual MIC. So if there is something close to the uh, actual uh, MIC cutoff, probably try using it, whatever be the beta lactam. And, uh, and we don't have cefidoracol right now. And in that situation, probably we need to look into chloramphenicol susceptibilities, phosphomycin susceptibilities, keptazidimabibactam plus astrionum synergy combination. And uh, that's where it stands. And then uh, if you're going to choose to use uh, colistin based on uh, CLSI criteria, then all the reports will say resistant or intermediate. Perhaps look into colistin susceptibility, having UCAS criteria for susceptibilities. There's no way I find that many labs use the CLSI criteria and report uh, club CLR, acinetobacter as colistin resistant. Uh, but, but you have another body from Europe which still reports colistin susceptibilities based on some criteria, UCAS. So you can try look into UCAS susceptibility criteria. If colistin MICs come in that range, and you don't have a beta lactam, beta lactam is inhibitor like septazinimabibactam bactam can often not helping, then probably try using polymixins. You want to and and, and may, maybe, yeah, in no, high dose, maybe in a higher yeah. dose. Maybe in a higher dose. Can I ask uh, BK Rao sir to switch on his video? Where am I? Oh, his, uh, his low, his will. Can you hear his me? Net is, yeah, his net is uh, probably low. The video may not take. So you can, saying, you can talk. No even problem. when you use these things, use them in a higher dose. Hmm. You know? But you cast, Dr. Balaji, would you take that? You cast findings, though it's a, it's a body internationally accepted the, as well. Uh, uh, it, uh, so there is a footnote which says that to susceptible. Patel, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. So the, there is no difference between the intermediate of CLSI and susceptible of UCAST. It's only the uh, playing with the words. In UCAST, there is a footnote saying that 50% of the susceptible isolates may not work. So, some Dr. things... Dr. I don't know, but my, my, this thing seems to be mute. No, you are, you are audible. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, we uh, always felt that cholesterol was not a very drug, very great antibiotic anyway. And if it has come into that, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, you know, uh, uh, a category where you try and suspect it, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be really uh, upset as that I am not able to use cholesterol. But probably you may put your, uh, your, your money somewhere else and get better outcomes. I do not know. Dr. Nambi or Dr. Rao could vouch for it as to how do they see the cholesterol lately when we are having the kind of resistance around with the PDRs? I think Want to add anything? Yeah. yeah. Uh, tra traditionally, what uh, the use of cholesterol in Indian ICUs has been from 2008 till 2020 at least. The last couple of years, there is thrust towards the use of phosphomycin, keptazidimabibactam, uh, all those things. At least for 10 years, all uh, clinicians in Indian ICU are using polymixins. And if you look at the overall ballpark figure with respect to treatment, I would probably am 60% success without any doubt. That's a ballpark figure. And uh, for a drug which is not being well studied, to have had a 60 to 65 percent uh, success rates for these critically ill patients. I don't think it's a bad uh, performance so far, but definitely I agree with you. The newer beta lactam, beta lactam is inhibitors are much more safer options to use 
with possibly better outcomes because they are much more safer to give and but there are situations where for an acinetobacter you may not have this bl bl like combinations work uh, or a difficult to treat pseudomonas where your all your options are out so we cannot really dump cholestin out or polymixin be out there are situations where we may have to use those things not as a routine just like that we were doing for e coli klebsiella but for acinetobacter and pseudomonas uh, when you are dealing with the xtr strains we may have to still use these molecules okay another area which uh, is very often asked uh, dr rao is current antibiotic cover or empiric treatment of sepsis you know this is a uh, you know very often uh, used language by most of our colleagues that they want to give a cover and uh, when the patient is in sepsis as an antibiotic cover which is an empirical treatment of sepsis would you recommend some kind of an empirical uh, treatment of with antibiotics in sepsis though the guidelines did not support that unless you have any evidence are you able to hear me hello are you able to hear me Uh, Dr. Watel, I think Dr. Rao is not able to hear. Uh, I, I Are you able to hear me? Are you able to hear me, Dr. Nambi? Yeah, yeah, I'm able to hear you well. So, okay, okay. Uh, is there anything that you need to add in these cases where empirical treatment in sepsis? Does it include uh, an antibiotic at uh, right in the beginning? Is it uh, 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 justified right away? I think uh, the, that is why if you look at the guidelines. they would always yeah. say antibiotics they never mention yes. about the choice yes. because what with respect to choice at gangaram would differ to what is in lucknow so lucknow would differ from kanpur so that's a problem and uh, that is where uh, microbiology labs and local antibiograms the quality of the microbiology labs and the quality of the antibiograms that is that would determine everything so for a, a rough thing a beta lactam beta lactam is in beta like prezilin dasobactam or kefprozon sulbactam is good enough for someone with sepsis someone with shock or multi organ failure that you think the focus of infection is below the diaphragm you would be starting carbapenems but if your overall carbapenem resistance in your icu is more than 20% then you would end up giving polymixins tg cyclin something like that but that is uh, highly variable it depends upon the local data antimicrobial susceptibilities and antibiograms that's right that could uh, uh, show some kind of examples when we are trying to think of using overboard uh, antibiotics as empirical for empirical use so uh, dr balaji i don't know if you can understand this is a gentleman dr nand kishore from dehradun who wants to know the reverse resistance of antibiotics by co administering resistance breaker what is expertise sizing experience or uh, uh so nambi have you used these two such two antibiotics reverse resistance of antibiotics by co administering resistance breakers what are those typical resistance breakers uh, yeah i uh, i know such so uh, yeah such terms we have not come across uh, unless uh, you have uh, uh, come across any of uh, these And I, I think, think probably EDTA is kind of uh, labeled as a resistance breaker. Probably the question was uh, kind of keeping that in mind. Uh, uh, even though the drugs have been approved in the Indian market uh, with EDTA based preparations, uh, I would always keep it simple. If my microbiologist and my lab is not uh, does not know how to test for its susceptibilities reliably for all these EDTA based beta lactam combinations. then i don't think we should be using it as a routine because the pkpd also does not support this dr balaji has a very opined opinion on this and uh, i don't know if he is uh, listening dr yes, balaji are you there yeah, oh, this is again that edta kind of a scenario where the resistance breaker yes, is there be used and uh, this is not a really uh, uh, we usually do not recommend because yes. of uh, uh, it, it is not compatible it is for an uh, carbapenem resistant isolate where metallo beta lactamase was present we tried to uh, do a synergy testing using edta when we used edta uh, 
that 32 uh, microgram was not sufficient. I think 37. That was what uh, uh, as part of the yellow research there. Uh, so we doubled that one with the 72. Still, it was not working. When we reached 200 micrograms, that is the time we saw the synergy. So then we felt that requirement for very high dose of EDTA is required to bring in synergy. With such a high dose, we are not sure about the safety profile of that individual. So that's where we gave up on those combinations, restore uh, ability of the EDTA. Yeah, that's right. So there is another gentleman, Dr. Balram from Rishikesh, who is trying to figure out the BCIT panel. If blood pressure bottle does not beep for positivity, is it beneficial if we put a biofire with negative blood culture bottle? I don't know how to comprehend I mean, that. I don't think so. Probably that may be a wastage of resources. resources. I think the I blood culture is, Yeah, the, please go ahead. Yeah, the blood culture has to flag definitely. Yes. And then uh, you have to do a stain. Flagging alone is not fine. It, you yes. have to do a gram stain on it. And yes. uh, when you do flag and then do the BCID, and you have a gram stain and then do a B BCID, and you have a gram stain on a flag black bottle, then, then it would definitely sink 100% without any problems. But without flagging, I think it's too experimental. I don't think we should do that. Yeah, no, it is, because it's not, yeah, because these, these are not standardized uh, like yeah. that. These are assays standardized with a particular biomass. If you do not have the required biomass, there may be no results at all. So it will be wastage of uh, resources. Resource. So we would yeah. not recommend such kind of an experimentation uh, as it is. So there are a lot many questions. I do not think we have already uh, taken it for our half, a, half an hour and we exceeded our session also for this uh, this reason only. I don't think we can take, uh, We uh, 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 I will request the organizers if they have the mail IDs of these We'll try and reach them out and send the answers by email to them. And I would uh, like to thank my panelists uh, for being here uh, for such a long time and deliberated on this very important issue, which is uh, though very close to my heart. And equally, I can see it with my panelists over here who have deliberated very wholeheartedly on the subject. And I'm sure many, many more must have got uh, benefited across the country and maybe in the South countries uh, as well. Uh, thank you very much. I hand over the mic uh, back uh, to the organizers for uh, ending the session. Thank you very much. I appreciate your presence over here. Thanks a lot. Mr. Varun or Mr. Himangaroy. Mr. Roy, are you there? Yes, sir. Thank you. And uh, you can sign off. Thank you very much. Great for thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the support. Thanks, okay, my thank panelists, you. Dr. Rao, Dr. Balaji, and Dr. Nambi. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Till we meet again. Sure, sir. Bye.